Good morning, everybody. Our first keynote talk today is by Patricia Williams, the University Distinguished Professor of Law and Humanities at Northeastern University with appointments in the Law School and the Department of Philosophy, and where she also holds the title of Director of Law, Technology, and Ethics Initiatives. Professor Williams studies how and when privatized governance structures may conflict with public and constitutional commitments to fairness, equity, and human rights. She's particularly known for her analyses in the areas of race, ethnicity, gender, and class. The recipient of a MacArthur Genius Grant, Pat writes an award-winning column for The Nation magazine entitled Diary of a Mad Law Professor. Thank Please you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's such a tremendous pleasure to be here. Um, so good morning and thank you. Thank you particularly to Aaron and Ryan for uh, getting me into this, this room. And of course, my many, many thanks to the amazing Cynthia Dwork. I am really pleased to be here, but also quite intimidated. Um, being among you is hard because I am so aware of speaking a foreign language. <laughs> And I mean that quite literally. If it's anything I've learned from years and years of talking with Cynthia is that we use the same words in different ways. We don't mean the same thing by the word equal. We don't even mean the same thing by the word fairness. She and many of you speak in the grammatical operations of computational language and my native tongue wags your eyes. So being here today is a great opportunity to explore what I think of as the translational project that makes talking to Cynthia so much fun for me and to see if it has resonance beyond my own peculiar curiosities. And so as a legal academic, I work in a field which interrogates the world largely through the word, both written and testimonial. We spend our lives assembling briefs, delivering papers, writing articles. And when COVID-19 brought most of the world to a standstill, there was a seismic shift in professional priorities. Court cases, conferences, and classes suddenly shifted from the realm of human encounter to that of cyberspatial distance. Lectures didn't feel like lectures anymore. Delivering a paper didn't feel much like an academic engagement. And by its own terms, filing court papers electronically became an oxymoronic performance. And it is not just that the crisis made these procedures taxing and unfamiliar. What we've also felt is that something foundational was undone. The symbols and rituals of professional legitimacy in the law were themselves undermined by delivering this stuff through a non-textual medium like Zoom or Skype or Teams. And the word we use is so apt. We are remote with, from, and to one another. And it's challenging. It's like working behind a giant mechanical mask. It doesn't feel epistolary at all, at least not in the sense that advocacy and the kind of teaching I do usually evokes for most of us. And I hate it, frankly. <laughs> to me, teaching through my laptop or talking to you now feels like, and I think I told Cynthia this, it feels like I've cooked a nice dinner for everyone, a lovely roast chicken, say, with potatoes and green beans, but no garlic, Cynthia. But then I have to hold it up to the screen, proffering it with a vain imperative. Dig in. Now, of course, many of us are doing that already. I've got digital gifts of cornbread from Seattle, pumpkin carrot cake from London. I have a whole cyber larder of foods I can't eat. In order to perform myself to an audience, in other words, I have to stand inside an exoskeleton of myself. I have to learn to walk with a prosthetic, calculate every interaction, learn how to allow this platform, in effect, my mechanical brain, to translate the subtle intonations, not just to view my audience, but also of myself. I have to translate and perform in a way that recreates the three-dimensional personality that one takes for granted intra personas. And it is a rather painful stretch to coordinate myself in relation to this thing in order to make complex communication possible. And maybe I shouldn't say this to this audience, but it feels, I feel significantly reduced by having to present myself through a technology 
again, whose very name captures the dilemma of distance, of distancing, of distance learning. And so I manipulate this marionette of myself, trying to get my limbs to work just right, not to get tangled or lost in the strings, the chat rooms, and the filters. And worst of all, the machine structures encounters so that I have to watch my own face perpetually, <laughs> sallow, flattened, and out of sync by microseconds. And it instills a sense of self-consciousness. And it, this is, in a way, the material enactment of W.E.B. Du Bois's notion of double consciousness, as he called it, in his book, The Souls of Black Folk. That is to say that somebody is always watching you or surveying you. And I am always now watching myself as I watch others watching me. And that can be stressful. It is a stress. And it is, I think, part of the stress of being Black. One sees that actually echoed in many of the demonstrations one sees on the streets. Um, and it is a feature of this technology that we are now all increasingly stressed, all of us. This is not just a racial phenomenon, stressed by being seen all the time, sorted and marked in this technologically efficient panopticon. And so to me, these negotiations through mechanical filters also feel like a form of aphasia. I have to carefully plug my lovely words into the jittery staticky medium of Blackboard or Microsoft Teams and hope that the right sounds and the right sights are what come out of the multiple mechanical mouths set up in the multiple kitchens, bedrooms, studies, and gardens on all the other ends. We are partialized and stuttered in this rather literal way. And just so, justice interrupted <laughs> seems legion these days. Machines have become both agents and witnesses in ways that are difficult to cross-examine for us as lawyers. Digitized images are commonly treated as transparent transmitters of truth with no resources available for forensic analysis or chain of custody and handling. Where errors occur, it's one thing to work it out and correct it as a puzzle in the lab, but on the ground, there is frequently no amnesty, no forgiveness, a limited right to be forgotten in an online world where one's worst choices and lowest moments live beyond one eternally haunting in cyberspace. So I think that the thoughtfulness in assembling this organization might help me decipher, might help lawyers, the system of governance generally of all of us as a society, decipher the norms embedded in the syntax and semantics of justice as a system of governance, and to then reassemble them for application in algorithmic platforms. And so I think of print media, visual media, and numeric representations, each existing in different discourses or languages. And these parallel universes operate according to their own logics, their own referential and connotative systems, including tolerance for ambiguity, how meaning is paired with form, perspective, compositional, and framing conventions, uses of active or passive voice, and relations to past, present, and future. And I'm concerned that democratic values, such as those contained in the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, or Human Rights Conventions, are being sidelined in a world rapidly shifting from print or verbal systems of communication to digitized visual technologies and vocabularies and quantitative discourses of numeracy as the dominant languages. So law as a system we teach in law school, for example, regulates provocative, untrue, or inflammatory representations through the rules of evidence. But those rules are bewildered by social media representations of individuals, ideologies, and political issues. Justice itself is bewildered by hyper exposure at the hands of data stalkers, anonymous cyber attacks, invasions of financial privacy, and revenge porn, and now murder porn actually, circulated to millions. Fairness is bewildered by the near impossibility of challenging misidentifications made by proprietary algorithms that assort who's in and who's out in life altering ways and that are not appealable. And these assortments impose new and presently impermeable, not necessarily, but presently quite impermeable categories of racial, gendered, and class segregation. And their decision-making power operates outside the traditional realm of accountability defined by jurisprudential notions of human agency. Empirical testing and randomized clinical trials may be confounded by impenetrably privatized black box estimates of cost benefit, risk 
calculation. And so my long-term work has been in devising a translational system that goes first behind the rules we call law and then aligns them with secondly, the aesthetics of visual or digital literacy. And then thirdly, aligns them as well with the persuasiveness of mathematical descriptions of causation. And I'd like to align these parallel symbolic systems with the ingredients of fairness felt or a system of a sense of justice done. And I see it as a multidisciplinary project of category alignment and pattern recognition. And I believe that there is a meaning making grammar embedded in each of these three genres of expression. And so it is my hope to track and translate these gestural, numerical, and legal discourses and to more fully empower, mobilize, and equalize access to vital resources of distributive and corrective justice. And the goal is not, I really repeat, not to conform or fix a universal language of justice. Rather, it's more to map the methodologies by which such designations are made and felt and to maximize those outcomes broadly viewed as democratic, participatory, and fair. So to give this an example, um, the theatrical space of a courtroom in which we hold our trials, it is what one might think of as a subjunctive space. And again, why I think of this project as one of grammar and translation. Legal fora in most democracies provide a space within which we contest what ought to be what should have happened, what might be done about particular injuries. And that structure of semantic tentativeness, or what I am calling the subjunctive, is part of why we value process as deliberative. Ostensibly, we take the time for emotions to cool, for all sides to be heard, for mitigating particulars or misunderstandings to be corrected. And the magic of due process in trials is that its ethic is grounded in a grammatical logic that begins with a mood and a tense that hesitates in deference to the conditional. When those conditions and considerations are met, then, then and only then a formal decision is made that transforms the conditional into a present tense as well as the definitive or a conviction. And that rhetoric, that rhetorical resolution, <laughs> nakedly procedural as it often may be, is a central feature of Anglo-American jurisprudence and, and broader metrics of justice. And I worry that new technology, or technology in its present iteration, too often removes that access to the deliberation of oughtness and places the mechanisms of decision-making behind proprietary walls. And many of those invisible metrics are based on coded notions of speed, of efficiency, and the substitution of plurals or generalizations or associational metrics for singular review. All in all, this transforms the deliberative promise of juridical time and juridical per particularity into temporally reordered generalizations about those like you as an abstracted cipher, removed from specifics of time, history, and context. And the singular you is pluralized by this generalization and then reduced to a permanent state not of subjunctive possibility, but of assigned probability treated as a fixed status, a redaction to a statistical number whose determinism remains unassailably future-oriented, open-ended, resistant to appeal or particularization. In other words, algorithms may reduce a first trial to what in jurisprudence we think of it's only its first stage, that is to say the might and it freezes all disposition at that moment. Arguably, algorithms circumvent the institutional faith-making and reassurance of public hearing according to rules of evidence that would resolve the conditional and render it, at least ritualistically, definitive by consensus, or by, in other words, a decision of one's localized peers. And so this rapid transformation of norms, networks, and formulations of community raises questions not so much about what the law says, but challenges the very foundations of the law's relevancy to newly imposed logics of autonomous operating systems and mechanical reorganizations. So it runs in reverse too. If I am trapped in cyberspace, you as computer scientists 
are constrained by the reality of politics and laws of private contract and market norms. For example, I was recently at a meeting um, about COVID-19 recently, and a wide range of academics and researchers had been invited, but it was mostly people from STEM sciences and computer technology, and everybody wanted to help, to kick into action and to use their talents. But here are some of the problems with, the, what, with what I heard in terms of how it was being discussed. The conversation was dominated by a very particular kind of discourse, optimization, game theory. Some spoke of data transparency as mathematical lucidity, but not necessarily the kind of transparency that makes data publicly available. Secondly, the conversation was not only about how to discover knowledge, <laughs> whatever that means, it was also about the creation and curation of knowledge in the context of a market economy. So I heard people wondering about how to, quote, create demand for product. <laughs> And so they were speaking the language of selling and persuasion and speed and efficiency. Worst of all, I heard people, from my perspective at any rate, from the juridical corrective justice, distributive justice notion, I heard people worrying about monetizing what they were doing, getting things patented and fast, plant a flag of proprietary and proprietary rights, and then property, which will then give you the right, the right to exclude. Pro one definition of property in law is the right to exclude and then to raise the price. Market values, in other words, not values of patient repetition and shared knowledge, eternal testing, and the idea that a cure might be hastened if we saw it as a shared human property, a property without price, an asset that not, ought not be the football and competitive games designed to see who can extract the highest price while those who can't pay can't live. Unlike the days of the sock vaccine, whose formula was made public and free for the entire human population, today we have disaster capitalism in play for ventilators, masks, the water in Flint, Michigan, hydro hydro uh, hydroxychloroquine, as though public health were a, sank a swanky accessory or a luxury brand of sneakers or a new Birkin bag. Finally, I heard in this meeting people trying to figure out how to get a piece of the grant pie people whose labs have nothing to do with and no interest, and they shouldn't have to have interest in COVID-19 per se, but whose funding is being slashed either because of general austerity measures or because everything is being retooled to address this crisis. And that's not necessarily bad, but it is if you're only in it because your 20 year study about Mr. Whiskers, the Onco Mouse, is going to die unless you rename him little Mr. Coronavirus. Now, again, these are not necessarily problems for theoretical computing, but they are the tip of a deeper iceberg that does and will touch all of us, touch me as a lawyer and touch you as scientists and social scientists. It's the problem of what Dana Boyd recently described as politics in the sheep's clothing of math. It is the problem of that, uh, the, um, of that data of, 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 of the problem that data is not just being assembled neutrally. As she put it, data isn't gathered, it is made. One final example of the risks of reductiveness as a translational matter. Many of us use Canvas, for example, as a platform to interact with students through which assignments, readings, group discussions can be shared with students. But Canvas monitors response to and with its usage as a value in and of itself. In other words, it is gauging its own success as it gauges ours. And it displaces and devalues what cannot be tracked by its metrics. In learning how to use it at my institution, I noticed that there was a numerical ranking of my colleagues based on how much their, quote, traffic their lectures generated. And I began to see that, <clears throat> that that is not just a site for social connection, but also a ranking mechanism in some relatively hidden system of institutional merit. But I wasn't even told that this was even a thing. When they were teaching me the system, I just happened to notice and ask what this obvious numerical ranking of faculty, obvious yet located so far over in the margin as to be almost beyond the frame, what might that refer to? And it is akin, I think, to what some schools more openly value as a way of keeping the institution the subject of buzz. Faculty with highly trafficked Twitter feeds or social media presences will be more valued. We all want to be more cited, but until this kind of data gathering gained primacy, citation was ostensibly about substance, argumentation, persuasiveness of ideas. 
But the IT people told me, this will help you know what your students find interesting about your lectures. And I disagree. I actually think this kind of ranking doesn't help me know what they find interesting. It simply tra tracks the traffic of their conversation during my lecture. It pinpoints the times when something happened that got students talking to one another. It could have been the color of my dress or that I tripped over a cord or that somebody among them hit the lottery in turkey bingo. And so this previously undisentangled part of my movement through the space of the classroom becomes legible as something other than me. Clean, clear, made free of context, I am reformed and informed as a ranked number in a system that judges the merit of my professorial professions based on how many hits I have, how many clusters of mention among students, but without any relation or any necessary relation to what I'm actually talking about, other than as relation to something like a wave interval in the ebb and flow of my words or the tidal flow of my talking. I am remade as the canvas apparition of myself, the pinpoints of connection to me as mapped by others the markers of where my voice resounded, the volume and the frequency, not the content measured. And this is the question to which I keep returning. How is one's very being known in a quantitative world? What am I in a tile rendered world? Tile rendering being only one of a number of graphic mod modulations by which I am transmitted, but exemplary for its abstraction. Someone once said that positivists are held captive in a metaphor, and here we are caught in a database of dreams, dreamed by beyond the wildest dreams of legal positivists at any rate. And this is my nightmare, frankly, and I don't know how to shake myself awake. I think that in its best sense, law is a discourse of civic inclusion, political inclusiveness, an opportunity. It is, a, it is a discourse of eschatology and repair. And by eschatology, I don't just mean the end times. I mean as the study of the destiny of humankind. Thus, law too is a technology that arranges our sense of time, of relations of past, present, and future, directing our gaze, altering our perceptions, telling us what not to see, what to see, making some things disappear. Law frames our experience in a world that is almost emotionally effective when well done. It does a little trick, an extra trick of naturalizing itself. And I think that algorithmic arrangements do the same and one must be very aware of that naturalization of itself for what then happens gets passed as what is and always has been. It's just the way things are. Again, the assortments of algorithmic governance perform this trick of settling in and making a system of performed belief pass as what is and always has been. Ideally, the goal of both law as techni and computer science as techni are to simply make us feel good about our place in a polity, to, to reassure us of our right to exist. And that right to exist depends not only on reductive concepts like securitization, but also on our ability to move among others in society so that we are respected, worthy of social encounter, allowed to share common resources and to move through public space without fear of confinement or danger or death. So at this surreal moment of panic and plague, I hope it is not too strange for me to suggest that this is what I hope a translational project might accomplish under the rubric, rubric of responsible computing, to find and embed something like law's concern with discourses of eschatology and repair. Again, make no mistake, I love the genius and the gift of this technology. It is my porthole and my portal to a mechanized reassurance that I still exist in a world of others, particularly under these locked down circumstances. Nevertheless, it feels as though I am pressing my humanity through a sieve of circuitry in order to communicate my complex and sunny essence. I have to literally juice myself, leaving pulp and rind behind on the floor. And what others read of me on Zoom, in other words, is a careful persona. You, the viewers, see my public skin, metallic and hard, my composite being held in the gaze of others, a perpetual conjuration, an anxious shield, a mirror in which the world sees itself. And therefore, my face is the face of a trickster who appeals to the vanity of others, who obeys the law, the laws, the ever circle, 
ever tightly tightening myriad of laws. I am a mask of geolocation, metrical measures of my irises, the formal signification of how I wear my hair, the clothes I choose to convey through the machine as cover. And this nicely prepared surface covers, I think, the ectoplasmic mystery that remains with the other me, the one here in this room, this unconfined forest of imaginings that my apartment has had to become, this interior with an uneaten dinner waiting on the table for you, my friends, one day. Here is the me, the many versions of a self that are stuck together on the suggestion or in the suggestion of a vibrant old woman, that would be me, yet one who is romantic and partly fictive, who looks up at the night sky and sometimes just feels herself evaporate. The phantom me, whose skin is transparent, who abides in a body of vulnerable exposures, pain points and daydreams, who savors tastes, and who is absolutely certain that, the, that, that this singular I will carry on and on and on without end. But this infinite ontography of melodramatic, I confess it's melodramatic yearning for selfhood is precisely what is lost as too much in the bare spare rooms of mechanical encounter. But it is precisely what one must bring to a child custody hearing, for example, or the triage of a COVID-19 COVID patient. And it is this excess, ruled as excess, that is also lost in much of the law, to our sense of justice, and to the human. And it is this essence that I worry that our technology simply cannot read. But it must not be displaced. Technology must coexist, not replace or displace that excess of ourselves. Because this is ultimately the essence that I think Cynthia convinces me might not really be lost, but only lost in translation. Thank you. And I see you saying- It took me a moment to unmute. All right. Um, we have a question from Ushnish Sengupta. He says, uh, regarding remote teaching and learning, some educational institutions are implementing automated proctoring systems, which are an automated detection of student facial movements to de detect attention or cheating. Are these issues of fairness and bias in facial motion detection that are different from known issues in facial recognition? And I would say with this prompt, feel free to, to speak as broadly as you wish. Yes, there are tremendous issues that, that lawyers are, and, and as well as social scientists are, are, are considering. I think often it is understood as an invasion of privacy, but I think that uh, this goes far, far beyond the question of privacy. Um, and it's why I framed my talk as one of, you know, of, of um, you know, th this question of exoskeleton. <laughs> Um, and of something which is really beyond our humanity through which we have to press ourselves like a sieve. And uh, the, 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 uh, if this were only about um, the integrity of an exam, one might imagine so many less intrusive ways in which to accomplish this. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it seems to me that that example and all of the other, I think that that, that example is accompanied by uh, proctors who are thousands of miles away, who ask you then also to have your camera and show your entire room and it's invasive in ways that are, um, uh, that, that really know no limits. And it seems to me that what this is a product of is really an uninterrogated technology that says you have to accommodate um, the, uh, you know, what is, a, what it, what is a given? And we haven't thought beyond um, um, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the, the social alternatives and the to say nothing of the cost of this. Um, so that's, that's the first, that, that, that's a quick summary of what, what, what concerns me about this. Um, okay. Great. Well, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so you said something that 
I probably should have known, but had never really crystallized for me. Um, you said that law tells us what not to see and what to see. And this touches on a very, very important problem that is often uh, completely ignored in the literature on algorithmic ranking, scoring, and decision making, which is how do we know when the representation that we have of an individual is is sufficient or whether the features that we have collected about individuals uh, are equally expressive of, across different demographic groups. Um, and I wonder if you could say anything about kind of Law's philosophical approach for trying to define what to see and what not to see. Maybe something that some of us could eventually translate into guidance in the online world. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, the word evidence comes from the root of, you know, what is drawn forth from seeing. And let me, let me since this is what's on my mind, um, let me take it to the example of uh, police citizen encounters that have resulted in deaths um, or vigilante encounters like that with Trayvon Martin. One of the big debates when Trayvon Martin died uh, was that, well, there were no witnesses, we didn't see it, and therefore there's no evidence that he wasn't threatening or he didn't have a witness, or that he didn't have a weapon and so forth. And so we're going to give the benefit of the doubt, but give the benefit of, doubt, of the doubt to whom? Um, and so that was a big part of the defense that George Zimmerman mounted. But notice the extent to which in cases, you put that next to the, the, the death of George Lloyd, you have cameras and cameras and cameras and cameras. You have all kinds. Of, in the death of Arbery, uh, uh, Mr. Arbery, the jogger, you have, you have video of it, but the discourse shifts to, well, I mean, I think Donald, Pre 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 President Trump, Trump said, well, th there's, a, there's a break in it. It's what we didn't see suddenly becomes important. Um, or what we see is something we can't believe our eyes for. Um, in the Rodney King beating, for example, we had a video, it was the first videoed encounter between police and citizen violence. He was beaten 45 times, skull cracked, jaw broken in several places. Um, and we were told in the presentation of that defense to not look at the video as it was unfolding in real time, but to look at each it still, and here you see, and then they used the, the vocabulary of a metaphor to say this is, um, his body was cocked like a gun. His arms were raised and uh, ready to fire. His arms, they were talking about his body, but his body became embedded in the metaphor of a gun. And it seems to me that the, the you know, law can do that, language can do that, pictures can do that in terms of how we frame them. That's, what, that's why we have rules of evidence which frame what goes into the hearing room, what juries see or not, just as a photographer frames, but also as algorithms depend on only certain metrics and you know, what goes in is in, informs what comes out. Um, so I think that this is a framing um, issue of, if, if, that, if, if that's what you were asking. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to follow up, but there are other questions. And since I have the privilege of being able to talk to you more often, I'll just um, postpone for now and, and, and pose some of the other questions and then we can talk again later. Um, okay, so this is a question from Zeynep Enyun. What do you think about computer scientists and engineers taking a more central role in shaping public decision-making in an increasingly algorithm-driven world? We are used to lawyers and economists populating the discourse in this space. But clearly, CS specialists and system designers are increasingly determining what our public life and governance look like. Yeah, I, I, again, I think if what is being proposed or suggested by that question is that the range of discourse and the range of influence on how we are governed becomes more broad, opened to uh, a, a broader range of voices and, 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 and systems of thought, all to the better. If, on the other hand, what I fear 
one is displacing the other, uh, then I worry just as much as I worry about, you know, the hyper econometric rule of uh, hyper libertarianism as being the only metric. Um, I think this uh, questioner is asking in part, how come the economists uh, get such prominence in this decision making and shouldn't it be shared with computer scientists? So if uh, you'd like to comment on that one point. Yeah, and uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. I, and, and, I, and I do worry that there's a tremendous distrust of law at this moment and, and that both computer scientists and economists have a deep distrust of some of the rules regarding fairness, access, and the right to appeal that are central to, uh, you know, how these systems are applied. And, 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 you know, simply to say the lawyers get in the way or, um, you know, the free market will rule. Um, I think is a dangerous way to go. Um. Okay. Good, thank you. Uh, the next question, in search of optimism, oh, sorry, this is from Omer Reingold. In search of optimism, would you say that within the legal community, the translation project is successful? There are different kinds of legal scholars and different kinds of legal practitioners, and they do seem to speak somewhat of a different language and represent different values. Is this translation project successful between law and other disciplines of research yeah i, I and, and again i i think that 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 what, what i refer to as discourse or you know how different systems of reference um enclose themselves or distinguish themselves from other systems of reference and that's certainly um one could say that different ideologies within law different schools of jurisprudence uh speak differently um the basic one to which I am turning my attention is, is that even within law, you have, I teach contract law. It is a very different discourse than constitutional law. Um, private contract law is the realm of individually assumed obligation with narrow remedies because it is all about personal choice and you don't want to penalize for making a per personal choice and therefore, um, uh, the, the whole goal of that particular discourse of law is to give people freedom and to reduce the costs of a mistake or a breach. Mm -hmm. Constitutional law is about the integrity of human bodies. It's about our sociality. And therefore, it, and, and it's about not stigmatizing us in our rights to, to be in community. And therefore, it, it, this is where we get civil rights. That's at the constitutional end. It is, you know, in, 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 in terms of human values is much weightier. The remedies, therefore, are closer to the things that, you know, that, that, that we take very seriously, like loss of life and liberty. Um, I worry that we have a history in this country, and that's what distinguishes some of the anxiety of this moment. I mean, these, is, that, is that you have a body of humanity that was taken out of constitutional discourse and put into the, uh, being the objects of contract. And that was the system of slavery. And therefore, if one becomes the object of private contract, if one is perceived as not having the rights of choice making theory, <laughs> private individuals can make decisions about your disposition in ways that actually have consequences that are, that are, that, that, that circumscribe one's life and one's liberty in ways that are not subject to the corrective measures of constitutional intervention. And then if you take that, solely we're only looking at contract and place on top of it proprietary or other contract driven systems of um social arrangement um you know the highest price in other words um algorithms like anything else it's no different from anything else that comes into the law at the contract end of things and that's what worries me that there is no sense of opening this up to the constitutional examination the constitutional discourse that we, you know, I associate with the American Constitution, but it also exists in human rights, dignitary and interests, perhaps even ecological rights, that we are interdependent beings, and that interdependency ought to be part of our discourse, that there is a we, not just a, a choice-making homo economicus. Fascinating answer, thank you. The next question from Michael Yang. One of the features of humanity that draws me to studying algorithmic fairness is that humanity and human decision makers are flawed. How would you reconcile some of those flaws with the thesis of your lecture? 
uh, we do the best we can. <laughs> you know, I am. I. I. I, I actually. I'm very suspicious, and that's where I, I actually said that. You know, that positivism is is a kind of being trapped in a metaphor and treating what is always. I mean, we live within the limitations and the understandings. And that's why, you know, I, I think we all need to be speaking multiple, multiple languages at every level because it gives us a sense of all the range of, 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 of cognitive variety um, and that there is good in that. Um, but I, I think that when we, um, uh, uh, that the, the, the singular quest for perfection or the conviction that there is only one way um, is part of what worries me about the determinacy of feeding our humanity into a black box and expecting it to come out with something that is better or necessarily better or infallible or treating that as infallible. If, if, if that's the gist of your question, I'm, I'm not certain. Okay. Uh, from Leif Hancock's, Hancock's Lee, excuse me. Do you see potential for technology to provide more complete representations of persons than what we currently have, rather than being merely reductive? After all, our, quote, unmediated, unquote, representations are not necessarily the best. Yeah, I, 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 I absolutely agree. And again, I don't mean this is, I, let me first absolutely qualify <laughs> that that's why I talked about this technology existing beside um, uh, other means of encounter. Um, I think that technology permits us to be face to face precisely in moments like this. You know, I would be in solitary confinement <laughs> if I didn't have this technology. Um, by the same token, I think that, uh, you know, it's, you know, <laughs> I, I, all I am saying is that the learned prejudices that we have in our social discourse are no less present in what we program or put into our algorithmic arrangements. And the belief, the hubris to believe that somehow they are pure because they're more quantitative is a terrible mistake. That's all I'm saying. How can we interrogate them? The, them being the representations that we have the, the quantifiable representations that we have again that's why i think it's really important to talk across discipline mm -hmm. and i give an example i think at the last conference that that that, that happened in, in berkeley um a, a year ago um having just gone to um my doctor for my scan because i am a woman of a certain age and so age is certainly contains certain predictive um information about the likelihood of osteoporosis. The fact that I am a woman contains certain probabilities for the likelihood of osteoporosis. But what this machine does, and you can actually go to Medscape and a variety of other, and you can do these little, they, they will, I think that it's, it's on Medscape or WebMD. You know, you can actually look and you will see that it says it gives you zero points for the probability of, of osteoporosis if you're black and five points out of an overall metric if you are considered white. Um, now this is a ridiculous, <laughs> uh, it, it's ridiculous. And so when I went to my doctor, the doctor took my bone scan and then he put it into a black box algorithmic calculation to see whether or not my scan deserved, uh, uh, you know, to, to be, whether I should be prescribed, uh, you know, a drug. And the, he paused and he said, well, uh, can't read it. It won't read you. And I said, why? He said, well, I, I think, and he said, very embarrassed. I think it's because you're black. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I suppose there are lots of ways to interpret this. You know, maybe the data sets weren't large enough, but why are they have a data set that's black as opposed to white for this? And, and so I said, well, you know, tell that upstart machine I'm white. It won't know the difference. Well, it did know the difference. The moment it thought that I was white, it came up with a series of questions that any patient ought to have been asked, like, have you ever broken a bone? Does your mother have osteoporosis? My mother had fairly severe osteoporosis. What bone was broken? Have you ever broken a hip? All of those questions were questions that were put behind the assumption, a racialized assumption, um, that is based on things that are baked into 
a medical model that is taught in medical school that is so unconscious that even people who consider themselves scientists or consider themselves doctors never stop to interrogate. So I think that that kind of interrogation has to come from the people to whom, it's, to whom it's to have constant conversations with the end users to talk about how these these assortments are artificial or filled with fables. Um, and so the mathematics may be right, the calculations may be right according to some metric, but that the social implications of certain of our taxonomies has to be understood. And you can only get that by a wide diverse of disciplines, as well as a bottom up listening, not just a top down application. Thank you. Uh, from Ushnish Sengupta again. Uh, any thoughts on blockchain based smart contracts? Should algorithms be entrusted with executing terms of a contract, including payments? Um, I, I think you're probably better able to answer that than I. <laughs> um, I do, you know, I've, I've you know, I, I, I have backed away increasingly in years since uh, not just blockchain, the entire notion of what was what were originally called shrink wrapped contracts. Um, the contract that I learned in law school was about a face to face negotiation. It was about the assessment of bargaining power. And one thing I worry about um, uh, not just blockchain, but the but but the mechanical interventions of a variety of sorts um, is that they do away with um, uh, the ability to negotiate the ability to um, consider. I mean, the very exchange, you know, when you put money, cash on the barrel head between an offer and acceptance, that money is called consideration or used to be called consideration. And it really revealed the extent to which contract transactions were in consideration. We are face to face and we're in. So the entire structure of law is, is based on that. And I think that the extraction of consent, the vitiation of consent, by these me mechanical assumptions means that we, have, we are not seeing consent, our, human, our human involvement with this is being extracted and substituted by metrics of risk or by assessments of risk. Um, yeah, I'm giving you to give you my consent. I agree to whatever the machine wants. I agree to enter this particular platform. Um, and it's, I'm not really consenting. I'm not really considering. I'm just doing it because I don't have other alternatives or because you know, the risk of not doing so is great. And that's a very different, so I think that the entire jurisprudence of contract around that is threatened or maybe even gone at this point, but that's the concern I have. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Pat. There are a few more questions, but we're out of time. So I applaud you and we all do uh, silently because you can't hear everybody in the webinar. Thank, Thank you. you. And for, for joining us for this for this presentation. It's my pleasure and my honor. Thank you. Thank you very much.